Hello. Durdi Bayramov Art Foundation, together with the Monk School of Global Affairs, uh, is hosting our traveling exhibition through the eyes of Durdi Bayramov. Uh, the exhibition has been applauded by the faculty and the students and has gained a lot of interest. And today we had the uh, celebratory reception. We're happy to let everyone know that the exhibition was a great success at the University of Toronto and we're looking forward to new friendships and new uh, cooperations. Durdi by Rama Foundation, I honestly didn't know about, um, which is really strange because you know we here at the Monk School try to be aware of everything related to Central Asia, the world region that we care about. And so when the representative uh, from the foundation contacted us um, and said there's this incredible art collection, my first reaction honestly was, how is that possible? Um, because it's uh, it's an inc it's an incredible collection, and I thought that there must be some something else to the story. Um, really, there's nothing else to the story uh, except to say that this is a uh, foundation, charitable, and that is uh, not not for profit, and is making available this incredible art collection and this incredible glimpse into Turkmenistan in general, the specific uh, artist Durdubay Aramov uh, in particular. And, uh, and what he has to offer, uh, you know, um, really the world. Um, and it's, it's something that people in Toronto probably wouldn't have been aware of. I certainly wasn't, and, and I pay attention to Central Asia. So it was a great pleasure to, to learn about the foundation. And as you can see, this is a, this is a great um, opportunity to showcase some of the things that he's done. Well, as you know, I mean, uh, Toronto, is, in particular Canada in general, is multicultural and celebrates its multiculturalism. I would say that Turkmen culture is not something that's on the radar screens of most people in Toronto. Central Asia might be to some degree, um, but it, it, it takes a special effort to make people uh, who are not who wouldn't otherwise come across things Central Asian aware of the richness of the tradition, richness of the culture uh, and the societies that Central Asia represents. And I think that's starting to happen as the Central Asian diaspora becomes more comfortable uh, being um, multicultural Canadians. Um, and so I you know I look forward to more opportunities like this. I'm glad to see we have a full house. Thank you for coming and thank you for bringing the sunshine uh, with you. Um, really glad to have you here today. When we were planning this event, we had initially hoped to schedule this uh, on or around the time of the, cel the spring celebration of, of Nowruz, uh, Nowruz, which is celebrated throughout the Persian and Turkic speaking world. And this would have been in late March, I think March the, the 20th or so. Um, but since this is Toronto, uh, it's a bit much to ask spring to come at the end of March. So we pushed it back a little bit, hoping that by April the 6th, surely, there would be, you know, flowers blooming and warmer temperatures and everything else. Well, that didn't exactly happen, but we got a hint of it, you know, just this afternoon, which is, uh, which is terrific. Seriously, thank you for coming um, to the celebration of culture and society along the Silk Road um, with a focus on Turkmenistan and specifically on the art of the renowned painter and photographer Durdi Bayramov. Uh, thanks especially to the Central Asia Lecture Series, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the Monk School, and enormous thanks to the Durdi Bayramov Foundation based here in the GTA, uh, and specifically to Kea Bayramova to my, to my right, who will say a, a few words. It's her energy, it's her vision, it's her enthusiasm, it's her organizational skills that enables uh, this event to happen, but not just this event. As you'll see, um, there, there's a lot more that stands behind what, uh, what we're really scratching the surface of today. When the foundation approached me about the possibility of doing a photo exhibit, and I, I suspect that some of you have seen the photos um, already. If you haven't, um, there'll be an opportunity to, to, to do so. I thought, what an incredible opportunity for our community here to see, to get a glimpse into 
the sort of um, to bring color, in spite of the fact that they're black and white photos, as you'll as you'll see if you haven't already, uh, to bring color to the discussions that we have at this university about Central Asia, um, about um, parts of the of the of the of the former Soviet world, to bring texture to our mm -hmm. understanding of the region. We do a lot of things here at um, at Saris and in the Central Asia program, but they're mostly focused on society, politics, economy, and those kinds of things, and we do very little. Um, on uh, on society and culture, and it's a shame. In part in part because we haven't had opportunities like this. So I'm really grateful for this uh, for this great great chance uh, to do so. If you haven't had a chance to to view the photos, they're tremendous. They're they give you an unvarnished uh, look, uh, sort of an unromantic look, but also at the same time uh, not a, not a critical look. It's just slices of everyday life from late Soviet Turkmenistan village life. You get a glimpse into what life uh, might have been like, um, uh, and but also at the same time, it's not only about Turkmenistan. It's not only about the Turkmen village. It's about humanity. I mean, I think you'll see and you'll recognize if you look at these photos that the, if you if you can strip away the specifics, the things that are specific to Turkmen culture, there's a lot that's general about uh, the human condition that uh, I think you can glean from these photos. And just from an aesthetic point of view, although as I think you'll hear about, the, the photos were not, were not designed to be the art of Durdi Bayramla. They were in fact a, sort of an instrument of, to create the, uh, the oil paintings that you've seen around. Uh, from an artistic point of view, they are pretty incredible. Um, today we've got, uh, we've got a, a series of presentations, and so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Kaya Bayramova, daughter of Durdi Bayramov. Uh, really the the, the vision, the founder, the, the energy, the, the source of inspiration behind this, this great thing. And, and know that this is in the GTA, and so it's, a, it's an opportunity to, um, to become even more familiar with Central Asian culture and Turkmen culture in particular. Welcome to U of T. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm humbled by the opportunity to be giving a speech at the University of Toronto, Monk School of Global Affairs, the first Canadian institution to host this exhibition, and I would not have it any other way. I would like to express my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Edward Chad for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you for showing an interest in hosting this exhibition and providing us with such a beautiful space to display, to display my father's photographs. With this event, I want to introduce you to the Durdi Bayramov Art Foundation, an organization aimed at promoting the life and legacy of Durdi Bayramov, a great Turkmen artist and my father. I would like to share a little background information of where we started and where we are today. Three years ago, when this exhibition was a feature exhibition at the Contact Photography Festival in Toronto, I had no idea where it will lead. I knew that I wanted to share my father's works with as many people as possible. He had dedicated his entire life to art, and I took it upon myself to make sure that his legacy would stay alive. My father was passionate about education and helped his students to realize their untapped potential by introducing them to the world of art. Perhaps this is why sharing this exhibition with academic institutions their students and faculty become a priority for me. Today, this exhibition is en route from one academic institution to another. When we started touring this exhibit, we took it one step at a time, and we're happy when it first launched at George Washington University. Later, this exhibit traveled to Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, and then Columbia University in New York. Today, our list of hosting institutions has reached 10, including institutions in Europe and Asia. The new addition to the list are universities in Pittsburgh and Indiana University. This warms my heart and makes me believe that what we are doing is interest to others. I'm sure that my father would have been humbled by all the attention his photographs are receiving. He had no idea that these photographs would be where they are today. He took them for private use, never thinking that they will be displayed in public. It makes me sad that he is not here with us to witness this incredible event. 
This exhibition is a celebration of my, father, of my father's legacy, his love of art and Turkmenistan. These photographs convey the boundless connection my father felt to his countrymen and his land. They are a testament to his unique eye and artistic versatility. To many people, Durdi Bayramov was a talented artist, but to me, he was also my dad and my best friend. When we traveled to remote villages of Turkmenistan to seek inspiration to his, for his paintings, he often brought my sisters and me along. Vivid memories of these wonderful trips have stayed with me from a young age. It is surreal to look at these photographs now. My mind travels back in time when they were taken, and the people, as well as the village scents, come alive for me. The villages where these photographs were taken are in close proximity to Merv, which was one known as the largest city in the world and a major center of a Silk Road. 2018 is the year of the Silk Road set by the government of Turkmenistan. And in that spirit, we are looking forward to new collaboration and partnership. Today especially, I want to share something important for everyone here to know. When you view the exhibition, I suggest you pay particular attention to the portraits. My father was interested in taking photographs of older people, although every time he did so, he experienced a degree of trepidation. This was because he secretly longed to find his mother or father among them, as he was orphaned at a young age. He often said, in the face of every woman, I look for my mother. All he knew of his parents was that they possibly live in one of the villages in the Marie region, which might explain why most of his photographs were taken in that area of the country. My father was a passionate advocate for art education, for all who inspired to devote their lives to it, especially underprivileged children and youth. He loved teaching art and often brought art supplies for students who could not afford them. To continue his legacy, my family and I have established the Durdi Bayramov Art Foundation in Toronto, a non-profit organization dedicated to celebrating the life and the legacy of Durdi Bayramov through educational programs that foster cultural exchange and stimulate the vitality of the art. When we look at these photos, we realize that these could be people we know. Our parents, our grandparents, our friends, our teachers. My father was dedicated to the unity of his global family. And having support from place like the Monk School of Global Affairs and others really goes to prove one thing. Art brings community from all walks of life together. Now I would like to invite you to watch two short videos, an introduction to the Durdi Bayramov Art Foundation, and a presentation of exhibition catalog that we published together with the Smithsonian Institute. Thank you very much for your support. Known as the People's Artist of Turkmenistan, painter Durdi Bayramov was born in the city of Bayramali on April 14, 1938. In an exhibition dedicated to his 70th birthday, the president of Turkmenistan awarded him with a prestigious For the Love of the Motherland medal. Полотна эти, вот они, чтобы играли. Они, чтобы они выполняли свое назначение. Сотрудничество между культурой Запада и культурой Востока, между культурой Туркменистана и культурой Канады, Америки. I was here for about four hours. I ended up just walking through the museum. Передавайте людям добро, любовь. Если есть любовь, то нет никаких преград. После того, как я однажды полюбил искусство с помощью моих учителей, то до сих пор я не могу расстаться. One artist brought such boundless spirit into our world. His name is Durdi Baramov.
In his black and white photographs, we find permanently imprinted the history and culture of Turkmenistan. Discover how traditions become timeless in the pages of Through the Eyes of Dorothy Bairama, Turkmen Village Life, 1960s to 80s. So now I would like to introduce you to Maya Sareva. She's our deputy managing director. Tell you a little bit about Turkmenistan. Thank you. So hello everyone. As Kaya said, my name is Maya Sariva. It's a great pleasure to be here today, especially seeing from where we started initially when the exhibition was only featured in Toronto and now that it's traveling and it's at such a premier institution as the Monk School of Global Affairs. Uh, it warms my heart. So um, now that you've seen a little bit of the photographs and you've f familiarized yourselves with the foundation, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Turkmenistan. And it will give you a little bit of a context and background information as to what inspired the artist. I'll cover um, about our history, I'll talk about our holidays, and the reason why I'll talk about holidays is because they're very much intertwined with our culture. So. Um, and I'll also cover an important topic, which is Turkmenistan's status of neutrality. Um, there's not a lot of countries in the world that have that status, and we're very proud to be a neutral country. So I'll start from the basics, and um, before I go on, I wanted to ask you, how many of you have heard about Turkmenistan before? Raise your hand. That's great. <laughs> we have a room full of people who are very familiar with Turkmenistan, which is quite rare. Whenever I travel to other places and I mention Turkmenistan, people look at me and say, can you say that again? Where is that? Um, so Turkmenistan gained its independence on October 1991 as a result of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Its territory is the second largest in Central Asia, and it borders uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. I'll show you on the map right here. I myself are, um, I'm from a Balkan region of Turkmenistan, which is on the Caspian Sea, but Kea is from the Ahal region of Turkmenistan, which is where the artists live. It's closer to the Iranian side. Um, the most of the territory of Turkmenistan is uh, comprised of the 70% of it is comprised of the desert, the Karakum Desert. While many people uh, will find a desert intimidating, Durdu Bayramov was actually very much inspired with it and he loved the desert. Uh, from uh, my conversations with Kea, he, he always find, found the desert very powerful and beautiful. So um, on the next slide, I'll show you the flag of Turkmenistan and our national symbol. Uh, here's the flag of Turkmenistan and it was officially adopted on February 19, 1997. It features a white crescent, as you see, a symbol of Islam and five stars. Those stars represent the five different regions of our country. Um, placed upon a green field is a symbolic representation of the country's famous carpet industry. As you see here, there's a whole bunch of display of different carpets. They're all handmade. So Turkmen's are very proud of their um, carpet weaving industry, and so that went on our flag. Each one, of the, each one of the patterns that you see on the right side, on the left side, uh, represents a different tribe of Turkmenistan. So there are five major tribes, um, Teke, Yomut, Chodur, um, Arsari, and Sarik, and they're in their chronological order with Teke being the largest tribe in Turkmenistan. As a symbol of the country's status of neutrality in international relations, a golden olive wreath was added, uh, similar to the one that you see on the flag of the United Nations. And um, uh, similarly, the coat of arms, uh, that you see right next to the flag represents the tribes and stands for the traditional values of Turkmenistan. Green and red colors have always been praised in our culture and the wheat that you see represents the salt and bread that the land provides. There is also cotton flowers that you see. Uh, Central Asia produces a lot of cotton and Turkmenistan is actually the second largest cotton, ex cotton product exporter in the region. So um, in the middle of the uh, coat of arms you see a horse and does anybody know what, uh, which horse it is? And Yes? Um, it, it is, yes, it is an Ahalteke horse. This particular I image is a lifelike image of our first president's horse uh, that was named Yanardak. 
So uh, now that we've sort of covered the, um, the, our symbol and our um, flag, I wanted to tell you a very quick rundown through our history so that you know where we are today and where we came from. Um, this is just a very quick uh, order of events, sort of say. While Turkmenistan is a very young nation, its history is rich and old. The territory of Turkmenistan has been populated since ancient times. Uh, Turkmen people, who were always horse breeders, and drifted into the territory, possibly from the Altai Mountains, um, and grazed along the outskirts of the Karakum Desert into Persia, Syria, and Anatolia. Alexander the Great conquered the territory in the 4th century BC on his way to India. 150 years later, the Parthian Kingdom took control of Turkmenistan, establishing a capital in Nisa, an area now located about 15 kilometers outside of Ashgabat. So, right here. So this is the old Nisa, and uh, it's, it's now an area that you can go and explore and visit and take photos. Durdu Bayramov was very much inspired by old Nisa, and he did one of my favorite abstract paintings, uh, was this particular one, also by the artist. So, um, taking advantage of Turkmenistan's good position, uh, on the Great Silk Road, the Parthians had conducted an active economic and commercial life in established cities. It is worth noting um, that during this time, the biggest city in the world, as Kaya has mentioned, was located in Turkmenistan. It is called Merv, presently located nearby a city called Mari. Many of you probably have seen it in call it Mary, but we actually pronounce it as Mari. Merv is located about 10 kilometers away from where Durdu Bayramf was born. This city was a stop on the Silk Road where merchants uh, traded for fresh horses and camels. It was around this time that the famous Silk Road was established as a major trading route between Asia and Europe. Um, today it is the oldest and best preserved oasis um, cities along the Silk Road. Um, after Parthians, Arabs had conquered the region, bringing Islam to Turkmenistan and to the nearby countries. They sent thousands of troops into Merv and they established a base there. Um, from Merv, they conquered most of Central Asia. Um, Merv also functioned as one of the great cities for Muslim scholarship, science, and artists. This is the ruins that are outside of um, Amari um, of the city of Merv, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's not ironic that actually Durdu Bayramov himself was born in a village called Bayramali, which is very close to Merv. Um, if you think of it today, a lot of Turkmenistan's prolific artists and people um, originate from, and also very entrepreneurial people originate from that area. Um, it produced um, a various scholars until it was later um, taken over by the Sel Turkic leader, Seljuk leader, Alp Arslan, who Turkmen also admire, and subsequently, unfortunately, destroyed by Cengiz Khan. Um, Turkmen opened up the doors to Cengiz Khan's son, and overnight they destroyed the city, killing over a million people. So after that, uh, Turkmen history sort of went from one place to another. Uh, for the seven centuries, um, Turkmen were under various empires and, and fought constant intertribal wars amongst themselves. However, by 1894, Imperial Russia had taken over Turkmenistan, and after 1917, the borders of Turkmenistan started emerging amongst other 15 republics. So um, ever since then, it was under the dominion of Russia until 1991. So I'll now mention a little bit about the status of neutrality. Um, on a path as a young country, but we're a very old nation, which I've already mentioned before, one of the first decisions that Turkmenistan ever made was the declaration of neutrality of Turkmenistan that occurred during a special session of the United Nations on December 12, 1995. There are about 18 countries in the world that have the status of neutrality, and Turkmenistan is one of them, which means we don't take political sides, we sort of, uh, you know, play the role of a mediator. Um, it was for the first time in the practice of the United Nations that such a special status was given to a country via a special UN resolution. And that is why, the, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Turkmenistan flag where you see the golden olive wreath uh, is uh, symbolic of our um, neutrality status. So now I'd like to show you
and talk a little bit about Turkmen holidays, the fun stuff. Um, so Turkmen people have embraced all aspects of ancient Turkmen culture. Uh, at the root of Durdu Bayramov's name, which we always talk about it amongst ourselves, uh, is the word Bayram, which means celebration or holiday. Turkmen people have always um, uh, loved celebrating things and they're very hospitable people and they welcome different events, but Turkmen peoples have more holidays in the world than any other country. There are 12 official public holidays and two major Islamic holidays, one of which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, there are also 25 national and professional holidays, so combined Turkmen celebrate 39 official holidays every year. <laughs> the holidays that we'll cover are the, are the following. The Turkmen, uh, Turkmen Carpet Day, um, here. Turkmen Carpet Day. It's celebrated on the last Sunday of May. This uh, became a holiday in 1992 after the breakdown of the Soviet Union. The main purpose of this holiday is revival, preservation, and development of creative Turkmen traditions related to Turkmen carpet weaving. There are um, usually that day there are numerous concerts and events happening around Ashgabat. There are also lots of competitions where the government tries to find the best carpet makers who can carry out the tradition of carpet weaving. Every, every girl who is raised in Turkmenistan has somehow experienced seeing their grandmothers and every child actually sees their grandmothers um, weaving a carpet growing up and that's something that I had the pleasure of learning as a child. Uh, you, you, as a part of going to school, also had an opportunity to learn how to weave a uh, rug. So now that I see it, um, there is some um, some memories resurface of my grandmother showing me and I'll tell you a little bit later once the presentation is over how to judge a good rug versus uh, not the best rug. So uh, we have a carpet museum in Turkmenistan which has more than 2,000 Turkmen carpets on display with some of them being very rare. There is also the world's largest Turkmen rug. Um, it is 310 square meters and it weighs uh, 1,200 kilograms. Carpet weaving is an important part of Turkmenistan's economy. Durdu Bayramov often used carpets as a background in his paintings. And as you see here, I chose these specific photographs, which are a part of the exhibition. Um, he took photos of carpet weavers, which he then later used as an inspiration for his paintings. Um, this is, this is uh, one of my favorite paintings. Um, it is currently um, housed at the Tretakov State Gallery in Russia uh, and it is Durdu Bayramov's uh, painting. It's actually quite large in size but I don't remember the proportions off the top of my head. Um, the, the burgundy or lush red is prominent in all of his paintings uh, as it is in all of Turkmen rugs. This is the largest rug in the world, um, the one that is uh, housed at the museum in Turkmenistan. And so, uh, as I said, Durdu Bayramov used our, uh, rugs as a background in, all of his, in a lot of his art and portraits. These are just some of the basic, basic examples. Um, this one in particular has a traditional Turkmen rug behind it, and that one is called Keche. On this note, I also wanted you to take a, pay a special attention to traditional Turkmen dresses and costumes of Turkmenistan. Um, it's wonderful that we're here in Toronto today because when this exhibition travels, we can't necessarily take all of these things with us to show to people so they can touch and feel and get to experience the items in person. The clothes that you see are actually worn to this day in Turkmen culture. So Turkmenistan is one of the few countries in the world that um, where women and men uh, on different celebratory occasions actually wear these costumes and outfits and we're very proud of it. Everything is handmade so it can take months to um, to develop but um, once it's put together it's 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 quite um, amazing. So uh, I myself am wearing a Turkmen made, handmade, uh, we call it Dawn, and um, it's, it, this one is uh, from Durdu Bayramov's collection, which is, I think is quite beautiful. Thank you for letting me wear it today. Um, 
uh, as I said, you know, we wear it day to day and on different cultural occasions. Another thing I wanted to draw your special attention to is Turkmen jewelry. You'll see some displayed here on the table. In particular, I mean, pay attention to this. Not only women or men wore different pieces of jewelry, but it was also Turkmen horses. So this is a very heavy piece from the collection of uh, Durdi Bayramov. So he used these as props for his paintings. Um, and if you would like to take a peek later, please do so. Um, Turkmen silver jewelry displays deep symbolic meaning and often mark the passage from one stage of life to another. Uh, from very early age, Turkmen women start wearing uh, jewelry. The shapes and materials are believed to protect from and ensure um, the women's ability to bear healthy children, to have a good life. The amount of jewelry a young woman wore increased over time um, as she approached the marriageable age. In addition to protective benefits, uh, the silver medal is adorned with carnelians, the red stone that you see in a lot of Turkmen jewelry. Here you'll see on display, this would be a good piece to show right here. So these are the red carnelians and this is made out of silver. Some jewelry pieces often have turquoise as a stone, but um, not as often as carnelians. And, and the turquoise stone serves as a symbol of purity and chastity. Uh, even, you know, as I said, Turkmen horses were even adorned in jewelry. The nomadic culture of the people didn't allow for larger sort of investments and settling in one place or building a yurt or a house. So people put all of their valuables into designing the best jewelry they could so they could easily, if they had to leave, could pack it up and go with them. Um, on that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about celebration of a Turkmen horse day. Um, Ahalteke horses are considered to be one of the oldest horse breeds dating back 3,000 years. They're known for their ability to withstand severe weather conditions and they're also known for their endurance, speed and intelligence. Something that differentiates them is their distinctive metallic sheen. Ahalteke horses are often referred to as the golden horses or horses from heaven. And it's hard to see, to, to see why, hard not to see why. They're considered to be one of the oldest modern domesticated equine breeds in existence. The breed as it is known today first appeared in Turkmenistan in the Karakum, a rocky flat desert surrounded by mountains, uh, which played a significant role in preserving their purity. Tribesmen of Turkmenistan first used their horses for raiding and they were selectively bred um, uh, for speed and agility. I'll show you a photo, next photo. Um, I, it has circulated over the internet, but not a lot of people know that this is actually an Ahalteke horse. Um, here's another photo up close. Um, the Ahalteke has a refined head with predominantly uh, straight or slightly convex profile and long ears. It can also have almond shaped or hooded eyes. The mane and tail are usually sparse. The long back uh, is lightly musculed and uh, it is coupled on a flat croup and long upright neck. The Ahalteke possess sloping shoulders and thin skin. The breed is tough and resilient, having adapted to harshness of Turkmenistan lands where horses must live without much food or water. Durdi Bayram was fascinated with these horses and in 1986, after witnessing an entire race from the beginning to the end, which spanned a total distance of 1,300 kilometers and took 23 days to complete, he dedicated an entire series of drawings um, to, this, um, to this horse race titled Ashkabad Kunya Urgenj Ashkabad. So I'm going to show you some of his drawings. This is another example of the Ahalteke horse. You see that the, they have a distinctly metallic sheen that shines when the sun hits it. So these are some of the quick sketches that he did just with a marker and any piece of paper that he could find while he was on the, um, on the horse race, on the road with all of the cooks and uh, support staff. Um, 
I wanted to tell you a little fact about this. So in 1935, a group of Turkmen uh, riders rode uh, 2,500 miles from Ashgabat to Moscow in 84 days, including three day cross, uh, cross the 235 miles of desert without any water. And if, if these horses don't run, they essentially die. The Ahalteke is also known for its form, grace, and uh, is a very good show jumper. So these are some of the um, sketches by Durdi Bayramov. We have so many more of them, but unfortunately, I can't, for the limitation of time, I can't go through all of them. Um, next, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about Kurban Bayram, which is one of the Islamic holidays of Turkmenistan. Um, Kurban Bayram is one of the most beloved folk uh, festivals. It is celebrated nationwide in a special way. Um, the first day begins with a solemn uh, prayer service, which precedes the rite of sacrifice. While in most uh, Muslim countries, this holiday is celebrated in special Islamic ways, Turkmen's have developed their own ways of celebrating. Our background as pagans blended a lot of uh, superstitions and uh, symbolism into practice. As you see, you know, in this particular photos taken by Durdi Bayramov when he traveled to different villagers, the way people celebrate is by standing in line to get on the swing called Hennelik. Uh, whoever gets a chance to ride the swing, uh, his sins get washed away. But it's, um, I, I've, had, I've been on one before and it's a very scary experience. Um, it, it's a, it's a, I believe it's a testament to survival. If you survive that, then you're good. Um, oftentimes the ride is so crowded and so many people are hanging on for their dear life. On these days, people wear fancy clothes, they visit their relatives and friends, um, and they entertain themselves with something called sadaka, where they, you know, um, will give a sacrifice, a lamb, and make delicious pilaf, which you'll have a chance to experience today. Mm -hmm. And uh, people greet each other with wishes. That day, uh, that's Kurban Bayram, they find it their girlfriend, boyfriend. Oh, <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's, it's an opportunity. Um, and Turkmen people are very hospitable. On this particular day, you don't need to be making appointments to come to other people's houses. You can just sort of walk in, and they'll welcome you with open arms and feed you with as much as you can eat and then sort of and then some so um, and last but not least I wanted to talk about a very special holiday the melon day um, every second day of August and it is celebrated around the time um, at this particular time because the melons and watermelons ripen and um, they're harvested at this time so it's a it's a harvest holiday in a way um, it's celebrated with so much music and dancing on this day. The best melon growers and breeders of the country, um, winners of the traditional contest, Golden Melon Fields of the Golden Age, receive prizes and diplomas on behalf of the president of Turkmenistan. Melons in Turkmenistan are considered uh, part of a great heritage. Whenever I remember as a child when we traveled to Moscow to visit our relatives, my mom put about seven melons in our suitcase and wouldn't allow me to put anything else because she, she believed that that's the first thing they're going to ask if we brought Turkmen melons with us. Um, so based on the research carried out by Turkmen scientists, there are now over 420 varieties of and biotypes of Turkmen melons. Um, that have existed over the last 14 centuries. Turkmenistan cultivates more than 200 locally selected varieties of melon. Most of them have been restored in the years of independence by the joint efforts of scientists and breeders. Durdi Bayramov truly loved all of the gifts of his motherland. And in that spirit, he painted so many still lifes dedicated to melons, watermelons, fruits, and other delicious gifts from Turkmenistan. Here's an example of one of his uh, paintings. Um, it is the background is set on a Turkmen rug and sort of covered with different uh, fruits and melons and um, apples, all of which are gifts uh, from the motherland. And now um, here's actually one more. This is from a harvest day when women are harvesting um, different. Um, fruits. I think it's, it's a spectacular painting. It's currently hanging at the Fine Arts Museum in Ashgabat. And here is Ashgabat today. 
um, a little more about you know modern day Turkmenistan. The country is developing, you know, as at a rapid space, uh, speed. Uh, the government has completely transformed Ashgabat in the past um, few years, in the past ten years. Today, it is uh, in the Guinness um, Book of World Records for having the widest marble city in the world. 2018 also marks a special year for Turkmenistan and was uh, proclaimed to be the year of the heart of the Silk Road by the Turkmen president. You know, drawing from its experience and being located on the Silk Road, uh, Turkmenistan's goal is to restore uh, its trade routes, communication, logistical lines, economic partnerships. In that regard, the country is aiming um, to invest and partner with countries to strengthen regional, you know, Central Asian and international infrastructure projects. I know that one of them is building a railroad that would go through all of Central Asia, as well as physically restore the UNESCO heritage site of the old MRF that I showed earlier. Um, in that spirit, the exhibition also plays an extremely important role, as Kaya mentioned, in opening up the discussion about the country's past and ways forward. We hope that the um, exhibition paves the road for more partnerships uh, on behalf of, you know, and for more institutions to jump on board and to want to host this amazing exhibition. And, um, um, especially partnerships that support and cultivate the arts. We think it's so important. Um, thank you so much for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free um, to ask me. I don't know if we have time, Kea and Ed. How are we doing on time? Well, we're getting very close to being ready, but okay. maybe a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions that I can answer while they're setting up the delicious food? Um, I can tell you one thing, that if you come to a Turkmen house, you do not leave without having eaten an enormous amount of food. So, uh, you know, in that spirit, we sort of decided to treat you all to Turkmen pilaf and samsa. And, and do not forget to take one, uh, there's containers of apples. Please grab one on your way out. It's for all of our guests today. Uh, I find uh, Turkmenistan's uh stance on neutrality to be especially valuable in a world that's so divided mm -hmm. and so easy for any one of the partisan political parties or the Soviet to buy the others out of mm -hmm. their loyalty. Mm -hmm. And yet Turkmenistan has been able to maintain that, that neutrality. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the economic foundation that allows it to remain neutral, or does, does it have anything to do with economics, or is it just purely cultural? Um, well, it's not purely cultural. It's um, you know the status of neutrality is very much um, it's it's both political and economic as well, but. Um, I'll give you an example. When there was, uh, when the United States was sending troops to Afghanistan, there was a lot of negotiation with Turkmenistan in terms of what kind of role it would play in uh, helping. And the government was very careful about not taking a certain side uh, stance. And all they have allowed is to the use of the airspace to get to Afghanistan. They said we will not allow any troops to be in Turkmenistan to be sent to Afghanistan. So that's a, an example of sort of political decisions. But in terms of economic Turkmenistan, I think, is opening up more to trade and uh, economic affairs with nearby countries, Central Asia. I think each country is still trying to figure out their position and where they're moving. And so in that sense, uh, we're also very much learning on our past. And uh, right now, especially in this particular year, I think you'll see a lot more partnerships, um, interregional partnerships. I think right now they're talking with China about building um, another pipeline. There's also another TAPI pipeline that's in discussions, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, which would connect the region. Um, so a lot more infrastructure projects. But in terms of economic affairs, I think um, it's quite hard to remain neutral in this, you know, in this day and age in terms of the economy. So Turkmenistan is open to trade. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but... It, it uh, is a quite a long way to answer it. The, if I could just ask a subsidiary question later. Is the monk school 
showing interest in this unique feature of Turkmenistan in terms of the scholarship it promotes? And is there scope for doing academic work in this area? Because being a Canadian place of learning, which, you know, Canada being so pluralistic and cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. uh, there, it seems to me that this is a good place to plant the seed and make it grow bigger. I'll let Ed answer that. So the, the question is, is the Mug School interested in, in taking the example of Turkmenistan's neutrality and um, just, well, I, the, the, answer is, the answer is yes. I mean, it's a very fascinating case, both in a, in a, in a practically uh, instructive one, I think, for a lot of uh, for a lot of countries around the, around the globe. I mean, frankly, as you got at the very beginning, Turkmenistan is very far from Canada. So, the, as a model, um, if, uh, even a political model, it's uh, it's remote, and so I mean I think it stands it stands to to have more discussions about these kinds of mm -hmm. things. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, there's much to learn. Isn't it true though that Turkmenistan has um, a lot of natural resources like Canada, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of parallels there, and mm -hmm. that would be something that the monk school would want to you know, explore those parallels and, and look at the economic viability of, uh, of, of, of either marrying or leading a country that's coming out of, in a development mm -hmm. sort of phase mm -hmm. to make them, you know, to make them more prosperous. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So the question is, you know, the, given the, the profile, the economic profile, natural resource related profile of both countries of Canada and Turkmenistan, and of course this goes for other countries in, in the Central Asian region, there is a natural affinity. There are natural conversations that, that, that can be had. Um, there is an interest on the part of the Canadian business community in uh, mining and other kinds of um, other kinds of activities in, in Central Asia. Um, it still could be thicker. It could be thickened, yes. right? And so uh, I think that that's a you know perhaps this is one way to, as you, as you, somebody mentioned, Kaya mentioned at the beginning, you know, art brings people together, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps uh, perhaps this is a way to sort of accelerate the conversations. It's a good start. Yeah. It's a good start. There's a question. Yeah, two more. Two more, two more questions. Warm, the right? food is warm. Too. Yes. Uh, two questions, if you don't mind. What would be the best time to go to Turkmenistan? And the second question, as an independent traveler, I know, uh, unfortunately, uh, this country is very, very difficult to get visa. Mm. It's almost impossible. Any recommendation you can give us as an independent traveler, any tricks how mm. to shorten the time? Because for some of, some of us, it's taken up to seven years okay. just to get tourist visa. I think, uh, Thank you. So, Thank you for that question. I know that, that the people have had issues with entering the country and it's again very much tied to the status of neutrality. Government does very thorough work about making sure that you know you go as a tourist and you don't bring your political views with you. But um, there are there are tourist organizations that are approved by the government that can help you get a visa. So if you if you apply with them and um, you show your interest in I don't know photography and you want to take photos and you want to see the country and culture, and if that particular tourist agency is approved by the government, then you sh your chances should be pretty good because there's so many of them now, and not all of them have a relationship with our government. Um, and one more question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was wondering, you pointed out the five different tribal groups mm -hmm. on the flag, and, and so it's interesting they're recognizing mm -hmm. the tribal groups within the nation. How strong is each particular group's, or how strong do people identify with their particular group as compared with how they identify as Turkmen? Turkmen? As um, so I think before the formation of Turkmenistan it was very much tribal identification. People would say before you ask them and say yes I belong to the Yomut tribe. There were a lot of intertribal wars but after the formation there were so many nationalist programs to try to unify all Turkmens and we're also sort of now the identity is I am Turkmen and if you do ask which tribe do you belong to people will say yes, I am you know, Yomut or I am Teke. Um, and it is especially, I think, evident in our cultural sort of, um, you know, in our clothing. Each pattern 
signifies which tribe you're from or the story of the woman who actually weaved it. Um, so there's, um, there's that element. But I think the government has done a very good job in establishing a national identity. And so we're very much Turkmens before we're Teke or Yomut, but it's just something we're proud of because we all bring different things to the table, right? If you look at the rugs that are displayed, the small rugs in front of you, they have different patterns. So it, they're all beautiful in their own way. So we make sure to accentuate and show them all um, to you. So I actually want to add something. So we have um, a guest, Natalia Nikrasova here, who is expert in Turkmen yes. carpet. She is. Uh, she used to work 20 years in uh, a museum. Um, yes, yeah, maybe museum you can. Museum of Oriental Art in Moscow. Yeah. Oriental Art, yes. And now here in Textile Museum, shows she is expert. Once she, um, we had um, a lecture and it was fascinating to, to be there. So she mentioned that if you want to know which tribe you enter to the home, so you will see the carpet. You know yeah. exactly from which tribe this family is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Before the person says it, if you just see by what they're wearing or the kind of rugs they have in their home, you know instantly. Uh, I mean, if you don't know, then I'll, they'll of course tell you. But, but yes, they're all different. So. We also have uh, in-house. Uh, the experts in Turkmen jewelry, jewelry, the biggest collector of Turkmen jewelry, that their collection in the Metropolitan, uh, Maryland and uh, Marshall. Yeah, well, Marshall. Both. Thank yeah. you so much for being here today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're so nice. So you're I'm so just nice. yeah, putting this on your head right yeah, yeah. now, oh but God, then yeah. yeah. So, yes. Oh, how does it You're look? an honorary tourist. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> like Yeah.